You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. Relationships are everything, and in Nashville, they're made of solid gold. When J.C. introduced me to Naomi Judd, and we interviewed her at her compound in Leapers Fork, Tennessee, her husband Larry Strickland was sitting on a couch in the recording studio at their barn, just listening quietly. But when he spoke, his rich, deep voice filled the room. It shook me. I knew I had to interview him because his long career as a bass singer is like a page out of country music history. From humble beginnings singing with gospel quartets on weekends in high school, Larry Strickland made his way in country music, and he reached the pinnacle of success, singing bass for the king of rock and roll. You're standing on stage in Vegas. You can hear the crowd pass the curtain, and they start this 2001 Space Odyssey music, and the hair starts standing up on the back of your neck, and it gets louder and more intense, and the crowd's going crazy. And just when you think you're about to explode with intensity and excitement, out walks Elvis. The fact is, there are not a lot of people in the world today with first-hand stories of what it was like to share a stage with Elvis Presley. And that makes Larry Strickland a witness to music history. His story and his talent are a testimony to working hard every single day with the kind of persistence that just won't quit. We started out at the beginning and covered a lot of ground. So put your feet up and take a listen. You grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is the tobacco capital of the world. I read Mm. that you used to pick tobacco. Tell me what that's like. My parents thought it was a great idea when I was growing up as a kid, you know, to have me and my brother work in tobacco during the summertime, you know, to earn extra money. I mean, it's awful. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. They close the barns and they actually have heaters, kerosene heaters inside to, to cook it. And that's where they get that really gold color, you know, when they take it to market. It's just really yellow gold. It looks good and it smells really great. But boy, is that hot, hard work, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're one of four children. Your dad was a preacher. Can you tell me a little bit about your family, your hometown, the role of church in your life? Well, just about half of my kin folks were preachers or deacons or whatever in that part of North Carolina. And my dad was a pastor and my granddad was a Bible scholar and all this stuff. So we were deep into it. Church every Sunday and Wednesday night and sometimes, you know, we'd have, be having church in our in our home. It was a big part of your life. Yeah, it was huge. I'm guessing there's a lot of pressure when you're the son of a preacher. You can't do anything wrong, I'm guessing. <laughs> right? Well, well the but whole I'm town I, finds out about well, it, right? I, I took the other route. Most of my classmates, even when I was in high school, they didn't even know I was a gospel singer. I never talked about that, you know, and I was out singing gospel music on the weekends and traveling with a group. Let's talk a little bit about that. You started going to see other gospel groups, and I know your dad was totally into that as well. Tell me a little bit about those early years where you fell in love with gospel music. Well, this was the early 50s, but my dad was a huge gospel music fan. How he heard of them, I don't know. I guess he had heard some on the radio. And some traveling quartets came to Raleigh, and my dad took me. I was about 10 years old. I'll never forget it. Just four guys on a piano. But the sound that came off of that stage was unbelievable. And it just went through me. You know, it just penetrated my soul. And just the first time I heard it, I was hooked. I couldn't think of anything else. I knew it was something that I had to do. You taught yourself how to sing, and you taught yourself how to read music. I listened to records. All these groups, the traveling groups, would bring their product, bring their records, and and sell them, you know, after the concert. I had a collection of about four or five albums, and I would come home from school every day, and I would go in my room because nobody else was home. I'd be by myself, put those records on, and I'd just stand there and sing, you know, one record after another, you know, on and on and on. It was the bass vocal that got my attention because when it came off the stage, you know, and that low sound, it it actually vibrated the the pews or the seats, you know, that you're sitting in. And it just, that bass thing just saturated the whole room. And that's what what got my attention. (laughs) 
I, I say unfortunately sometimes because when you when you become a bass singer and you train yourself to sing low, there's not much else you can do. But you, <laughs> you're going to be low on everything you sing. You know, I want to tell you that as a person who spent most of my career in radio, when we would have our jingles sung for the radio station, the person who made the most money in the jingle session was the bass player because without him. It was a bunch of sopranos all the way up here singing Magic 106.7. But the bass guy was like, seven. <laughs> Wait, seven. Go. <laughs> <laughs> and without him, it was shrill, right? Brought That's what I tell everybody. You brought know. the whole thing together. <laughs> Unbelievable. But when a boy reaches a certain age, his voice changes. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to guess that was the day that you thought, Heaven opened up because you were able yeah. to get those real deep notes. Tell me about that. Well, not at first, as my voice did change. I mean, I concentrated then on the on the lower part, I'm, and I've often wondered if I had concentrated on the higher part, could I have trained my voice to, to be higher, or was I just destined to, to be what I am? Um, so, I, I mean, I just concentrated on singing low. And, and there then you, you go. You work on trying to get as low as you can because that's the How? goal. How low can you go? One of the first bass singers, and I think he was the first bass singer that I heard, was J.D. Sumner. And he's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records as having sung the lowest note, you know, off the, off the piano. So he was my first influence, and then, of course, later on, I ended up working for him and singing with him. Being a part of a quartet, what do you love the most about it? Because when I listen to it, it's the sum of the parts, right? Oh, yeah. What do you love? <laughs> well, that's, that's exactly it. When you have those four parts, and those four parts are on the right pitch, and everybody's right at the same place, there's almost a fifth sound that you hear. You know, it locks into a, to this total sound, and you can't really pick out who's singing what. It's, but it's 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 a magical sound, and it's a beautiful sound. Can you tell everybody about your early days coming up in the business, and what you learned? along the way, what were the toughest lessons that you could pass along to people? Well, you know, coming up through it and, and being singing on the level that I was, was was just, was very exciting. You know, we only got to sing on the weekends mainly, you know, still in high school and everybody else had jobs and we would travel just uh, Saturday and Sunday. But those were the highlights, you know, it was so much fun. We had a bus, it was a blast. Get up and sing in front of people, and they pay you for it. They either pay you or they feed you, one of the two. <laughs> what did you learn about being an entertainer? Because it's one thing to stand up with a quartet and be part of the whole. It's another thing to command the stage. Were you always outgoing? Were you shy? Take I was shy. I was, yeah. I was shy, yeah. It was, it was not easy for me. And, and I guess I never really got out of that you know i'm still shy even if i go on stage you know it, it it takes me two or three songs before i can really relax into it and uh, feel comfortable along the way you were in the army can you talk to me about that i went to the recruiting station you know to join rather than be drafted so i could maybe have some kind of choice and the recruiter said listen you know if you will join for four years instead of being drafted for two, you'll stand a much better chance of not going to Vietnam. And I jumped on that because I didn't want to go anywhere near Vietnam. And then when I got actually got in the military, they put me on a path that was going to send me to Vietnam. When my dad found out about that, he contacted one of our congressmen. And here's my little dad, you know, he, he was he's just, a he's just a preacher. You know, he was not anybody with any kind of political influence or anything. And how he got a hold of this person, I'll don't know. And I'm actually, I'm at Fort Gordon, Georgia, and I'm sitting in this teletype school They're teaching me how to do this. And all of a sudden, a, a guy comes in, the, in through the door and says, uh, Strickland, Strickland. And I said, yeah. He said, follow me. And I jumped up and followed him. He took me to headquarters, and they said, go get your stuff packed up. And he gave me a plane ticket and a meal ticket and sent me to Fort Devons, Massachusetts to go into computer school. I spent three years in Germany. And what was that like? It was it was fun. It was good. I mean, I had I worked with the I was in the Army Security Agency, but attached to the National Security Agency. So I ran computers and 
all my superiors were civilians, you know, so I didn't have to do a lot of the military type stuff, and it was a good duty and made good rank. I should, I probably should have stayed in. I could have retired. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a whole different career for you, right? Oh, yeah. You got a call from J.D. Sumner and the Stamps, and that changed your life. We happened to do a program one time with, with the Stamps, J.D. Sumner and Stamps. We opened the show for them. And afterwards, uh, one of the guys, Ed Enoch, who was a lead singer, came to him and said, hey, man, give me your phone number. He said, uh, we may be needing a bass singer at some point. And so I gave him my phone number. He put it in his billfold, and, and five years later, it was five years from that time when they, when they called. He, he kept my number in his, in his billfold. Do you know what the little... chances are of him losing that phone number and never calling you? Oh, yeah, I know. It was crazy. Wow. It was crazy. And said so they called me to come to Nashville to audition, and I got the gig, and I went back to North Carolina, and we packed up all our stuff and moved to Nashville. Tell me about that day. Do you remember it? Nashville was a very different city than it is today, huh? Oh, yeah. It was a much smaller town, much calmer, and the music business was all down on the music row, and and they had an office down there, you know, and so it was, it was all very concentrated. and. It was like a family, but I was, you know, I was mesmerized by by the business and by, just, you know, being in that, you know, in a group of, of that caliber and uh, traveling and the way we did. Of course, we traveled all the time. You know, we were 250 days a year on the road, you know, and, and singing. If we if we weren't singing with Elvis, we were out doing our own gospel concert. So just going all the time, but I loved every minute of it. Tell me about the first time you ever worked with Elvis. It was in Las Vegas. All right, wait a minute. You're telling me your first gig with Elvis Presley was in Vegas. In Las Vegas, yeah. And I'd never been to Vegas. I was as green as you can get, you know, as far as being worldly minded to any of that kind of stuff. Talk about getting um, thrown into the deep end of the pool. Oh, yeah, and I stayed down there for a long time, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, you can probably tread water, right? Yeah, That's what you got to do when you're in a situation like that. Yeah. Okay, what's it like <clears throat> to walk out on a stage with Elvis Presley? Talk to me a little bit about his talent and really the role that the Stamps played when you're on a stage with him. Well, you know, I mean, I... I kind of got used to it. I did. I did over two hundred shows with him, and they were all very exciting. But initially, I mean, you can imagine being you're standing on stage in Vegas. Uh, you can hear the crowd pass the curtain, and they start this. You know, this two thousand one Space Odyssey music, and you know, it's it's and the hair starts standing up on the back of your neck, and the and it gets louder and more intense, and the crowd's going crazy, and and the lights and everything, and just and just when you think it, it's you know you're you're about to explode with intensity and excitement, out walks Elvis, with in, you know in his one one of his flashy jumpsuit, you know, and that black hair. It was awesome, and uh, I was completely mesmerized to to be in the middle of that sound and that scene, with the crowd here and the huge orchestra here and him in the middle and. And all the, these great the sweet inspirations and the stamps, we were all standing there singing together, and it, it was unbelievable. I think the first few shows, I probably didn't sing a note. I just kind of stood there. And you know, I was just about to ask you, when you're taken aback by something like that, you probably say, well, whoa, I'm supposed to be singing a line here. You, know? mm, yeah. you can get caught up in the moment. Oh, yeah. Describe his persona on stage and off stage. Well, I think everybody pretty knows on stage he, he was... He's one of the best, uh, if not the best, entertainers overall, all-around entertainer. The show itself was so many different styles of music, you know, from, from gospel to pop and, and rock. I mean, just he, he did a little bit of everything and made it his own. We always had a huge orchestra. He loved to laugh, and he, he would, uh, there was all kinds of little things that he would say into the mic or off the mic, you know, that would be to us to joke and carry on, you know, and some girl down front would be going crazy, and he'd go over you know, and you may, you know, give us a look and go like this kind of thing, you know. And so it was always, it was back and forth and playing. A lot of camaraderie? <clears throat> yes. One of the first things that J.D. Sumner told me, whatever you do when you're on stage, do not take your eyes off of Elvis. Because you never know if he's going to be looking at you. And sure enough, he would look at us. 
and and would come over and, and sing at us a lot of times. Did he have a certain energy about him when he was on the stage? He, the lights hit, the mic absolutely. is live, and boom, there he is. Yeah, absolutely. It was almost scary. It was funny for a man to say this, but he was beautiful. He was a beautiful man, and just to see him there, and, and then you put all that garb on him, you feel like you're in the presence of, you know, something otherworldly or whatever. And then the voice, every song he sang, you know, he, he sang the crap out of it. No matter what style it was, he sang it with as much intensity as one could possibly put into it. Every song was... Could had, stand alone. Yes, yeah. Was there a song that you guys all loved to sing with him especially? The American Trilogy. That and, and How Great They Are, because we had pretty significant parts, you know, other than just oohs and ahs. We actually had lines with him, you know, that we would sing separate, you know, and he would always give us special recognition, you know, for singing those lines. The songs themselves were, you know, like huge, huge. Was he generous? Oh, he was unbelievable, to a fault. He gave away so much of his stuff, you know, so much money buying people cars. And at one point, he bought like seven Cadillacs for, for some police officers. Seven of them. You know, I mean, he's, he, he just would do ridiculous things. And then the TCBs that we got, and he gave J.D., uh, he loved J.D. Sumner, and gave him a lot of just amazing diamond rings and all this kind of stuff. And For those of you who don't know what that means, TCB is? taking care of business. And then TLC, when he'd give a TLC to the girl, you know, tender love and care. 1977, and Elvis dies. Mm. I was telling JC as we were driving here to your home today that I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in college. I just moved into a new apartment. I was painting the cabinets in the kitchen of this little apartment, listening to the radio. And just tears immediately the world cried mm -hmm. how did you handle that we were actually at the airport in uh, nashville the uh, we'd just gotten a call that they said the plane was going to be was about 15 minutes out you know to land and it, the plane was going to be taking us to portland maine to start a new tour we had, we had a 10-day tour coming up we got another call and the producer felton jarvis was the one that I guess he took that call and then came and he said, uh, guys, uh, something's going on. Uh, tour is canceled. Everybody go home and you'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll contact you later. That was all he said. And then, so I'm in my car. Now I'm driving home. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably his dad. Something's happened to his dad. And I hear it on the radio, you know, that it's him, you know, when I, while I'm driving home. And so they... Not long after we'd gotten home, um, Bern and his dad and, and other people in the entourage, they, they sent for us to, to come to Memphis, and we we were there, and then we, we participated, you know, in the funeral, that, that whole thing, so. I can tell by the um, look on your face that this was really painful. Yeah. Because Gosh, I know was, how the world reacted to it, but mm -hmm. when you're his friend... It must have just felt like the sun went out or something. Oh, yeah. It was a huge sea change, a world change. I don't even, uh, you know, look back on it now, and I'm wondering, was it even fair for them to have us sing? We, just, we were standing behind this casket, an open casket, and singing his song, you know, singing his, his gospel songs, the songs that we had sung with him. You've been a part of Elvis Week at Graceland and many other mm -hmm. celebrations in Elvis's memory. People still love this music. I know. How do you feel when you're singing it? I love it. They will have Elvis up on the screen, a big screen. They take all the music off, take everything off of it except for his voice. And then they would have a click track. So the, the drummer, Ronnie Tut, who was his drummer, would have this click track in his ear and Elvis's voice and Elvis on screen. The orchestra and all the singers were all live. And we'd do a show like that. And he'd introduce us, you know, just like he always did, you know, because it was a real show that they had taped at some point. That must have been surreal. Well, it was, but it was so much fun. You couldn't, you couldn't believe it. It's you like know, we're it, back it, together again. Yeah. It, it, was, it was the feeling. It had the same feeling. Let's talk about your latest album, which is called Legacy, Handpicked Songs That Matter to You. And I can't help but think when I hear the word legacy, I think this is like something you want to leave this behind. This is important stuff. Talk about the album. 
You know, I've, I've sang with quartets my whole life. Quartet and being a member of a quartet is all I ever wanted to, to do. And then I had some people uh, online, some of the fans, would ask me if I was going to write a book. And I knew I wasn't going to write a book because I just about everybody in the in the group in the entourage everybody has written a book you know so that I, there was nothing i could add to anything that's already out there and so i thought well i'm time's moving on and i need to do something you know that will leave a little bit of a representation of of my time you know and, and what i do as a singer and this kind of thing and so i i agreed to to go in and, and record what's your favorite song on the record you know they're old hymns Right. Um, I think uh, probably just a closer walk with the is probably my favorite over overall. You know the the track. I really like what the band did did with it. You know, and it's 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 just my kind of music. Let's talk a little bit about this beautiful land that we're in right now. This beautiful home that you share with Naomi and the girls. Mm-hmm. I know everyone lives here. Mm-hmm. We had a chance to talk with Naomi weeks ago and you sat right over on that couch and there was a moment when Naomi was telling her story of her early years and she stopped and she looked at you when you were crying and she said what's the matter with you and you said you're making me cry with this story she went through some really hard times Mm -hmm. and then there was you this is a long marriage Mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about what's the secret to a long marriage (laughs) a lot of give and take, a lot of forgiveness. You have to intentionally love and intentionally stay together. My husband and I have been married for, it'll be 14 years in August. Oh, you're married? Yes, I am. Uh, second I'm, I'm, second marriage. <laughs> but I wanted to talk a little bit about being a step-parent because some blended families don't work because, in my opinion, it was never my job to try to become their mother. Hmm. They already have one. I wanted to be their friend, their mentor, their guide, and show them that I could love their father. And it's worked. And it's probably what I'm most proud of. Mm. And I know these girls love you. Mm -hmm. How'd you make that happen? When I came into their uh, life, Winona was 15 and Ashley was 11. Over time, you know, I became pop to them. They're sweethearts, you know, and they were just intertwined. And it's a real special bond. What you also have now is history. When you've been a family for as long as you have, you've got those memories and all that history together. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this farm. What is it that you love about this land? It's beautiful here. We bought this land 30 years ago. We always knew that we wanted to own property, and when the time was right, I went on the hunt. When I saw the land and the rolling hills and the pasture land, I said, this is it. You know, this is all we want. Last couple questions I'm going to ask you have to do with giving some advice to people who are just getting started. What do you say to that kid who is sitting in his room listening to music and trying to learn parts and teaching himself how to read music? What could you say to him to give him some confidence? It's a huge commitment. You've really got to be committed to know that no matter what, you're going to continue on. And don't ever consider that you're good enough. You've got to hone your craft you really have to live it you know it's got and it's got to be inside of you what are the keys to being a really good entertainer you've got to find what is different and unique about yourself and then put that out front even if it scares you to death you got to be raw and don't ever turn down an opportunity you know somebody wants you to come in and sing background on their record for fifty dollars you know you go do it you never know what that will lead to Check yes or yes. Yeah. Right? You have an incredible legacy, a body of work. What are you most proud of? I guess the, the, the records that I got to record at Graceland, whenever we did those, those two sessions there, uh, they've turned out to be really valuable recordings, and uh, I'm just happy that I was on them, and I got to be there to see it go down and hear it go down and, and be part of that. It's history. Yeah. The key to success in country music is fill in the blank. Persistence. Larry Strickland, I want to say thank you so much for being our guest this week on Country Music Success Stories. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Excellent advice. And what an exciting life Larry Strickland has lived. 
this man has experienced some of the biggest moments in music history, and he really is one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. Hi, I'm JC Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. Today I wanted to talk with you a little bit more about what Larry touched on in the interview you just heard. Persistence. It really is one of the biggest keys to achieving success in the music industry. And to go along with being persistent, you must also be patient. Larry's career is one that has lasted for decades, and I can pretty much bet that when he wrote his phone number down the day he performed at that event with the Stamps, he had absolutely no idea just how persistent and patient he'd have to be. But it paid off, and Larry is a perfect example of how an opportunity can come back to you, even when you might be giving up all hope. It can be hard to think about the next 5, 10, or even 15 years dedicated to networking, meeting people, and growing your professional circle. But I have a few tips that I think you'll find useful the next time you're face-to-face with a person who might be able to push your career to the next level. Tip number one. Don't expect results overnight. When you meet a person who might be a potential helper on your road to success, don't worry about what the outcome of meeting that person might be. Just stay in the moment. Be yourself and make a good impression. If something is meant to come out of it, it will. Don't worry about rushing to figure out what that thing is. It will reveal itself in time. Tip number two, don't be pushy. Industry veterans here in Nashville, and I can imagine in every other musical city, are very aware of people who are a little too eager to get to where they want to be. This can be a major turnoff, so make sure to keep your composure and don't ever pressure anyone into thinking they should help you. If you've made a good impression, and if you really have something to offer that they can assist with, it will happen organically. My next tip is this. Once you've met someone who you've really had a connection with, follow up. I've mentioned this so many times before, but a good follow up is never a bad thing. A thank you note, a message to say how nice it was to meet someone, or even a social media connection, a follow, a DM, or even a simple like on a post, it goes a long way and it keeps you in the consciousness of other people. Tip number four, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. This is a recipe for pure letdown. If you've met someone that you think might hold the key to the gateway of your success, that's great, but don't rely on only that. Like Larry told Candy in the interview you just listened to, he did give his phone number to the Stamps in hopes of getting that call that would ultimately change his life. And it did, but he didn't stop working towards his goal while he was waiting. Larry kept singing, kept making connections, and when he finally did get that call, he was that much further ahead and ready for the opportunity. My last tip is this, you never know when you might walk into a room and come face to face with a person who could potentially change your life and your career. Be nice to every single person you meet. Even if someone isn't in a position to help you right now, that doesn't mean they won't be one day. And if you're in a position to make an impression, act like your life and your career depends on it because it just might. And here's a little bonus tip. Always remember the people who helped you along the way. Make sure they know just how important they were on your journey. And even though you might not think of yourself being in a position to help others just yet, if you are persistent and patient, one day you will be. And when you are, remember how important it is to reach your hand back out and to do your part to help the next person coming along. There's another great piece of advice from Music City mentor, J.C. Don Valeris inspired by the wisdom of Larry Strickland. For a free tip sheet on the importance of patience and persistence as you build your music career, just go to candyoterry.com backslash country music podcast. Subscribe to JC's YouTube channel for insights and advice on how to make it in Nashville. If you liked country music success stories, please leave a review and check out our new website, countrymusicsuccessstories.com. Follow us on social at Candy O'Terry and at JC Dawn Valeris. Our new Facebook and IG handles are at Country Music Success Stories. I'm about to hop on a plane from Boston to Nashville to meet more legends and record more stories. I can't wait. Thank you so much for listening. 
to Country Music Success Stories.